Hi there, this is Mark Icero, and welcome to Article Club, an experiment in community reading where we read and discuss one great article every month on race, education, or culture. I'm happy that you're here and listening because this month we're reading Jerry and Marge Go Large, and this week on the podcast I got to interview Jason Figoni, the author of the piece. I have to say it was a huge honor to get to talk to Mr. Fagoni, and in our conversation, he shared a lot of behind-the-scenes details about the article that I know you'll appreciate. Also, good news, Jerry and Marge Go Large is now a book, like a little physical book, which I think is pretty great. Mr. Fagoni talks about the book toward the end of the interview, and I have my copy right here, and I have to say it has brought some significant joy to my life. If you want a copy, I'll leave the link in the post. All right, let's get to the interview right now with Jason Fagoni. Thanks so much, Jason, for doing this. It's really great for you to be on Article Club. Thanks so much. Uh, Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me here. Before we get into the article, I did want to ask a little bit more about how you became a writer. Like, I know that you were on your high school newspaper, which um, I was too. But then can you say a little bit about um, college and like what happened for you in college and becoming a writer? Yeah. So I would say from a young age, I really only wanted to be a writer, right? And I, and I kind of, I put all of my cards into trying to figure out how to be a writer. And my initial experience with uh, journalism in high school convinced me that journalism would be fun. That would be a good way to be a writer. And so in college, I, uh, I joined the daily newspaper at Penn State University. So it was a big state university, so they had a really large uh, daily student paper. In those days, it was uh, printed uh, every morning. It, was, it, it, it would arrive on the doorsteps of dorms, just like the uh, USA Today and Wall Street Journal and other national papers. And, and it had a circulation of 20,000. And so it was a big staff, big paper, and I learned how to uh, report, how to edit, how to do uh, a lot of other different things. And that was a big part of my college experience for the five years that I was there. And then I graduated and I sort of continued to want to be a writer. So I, I took a job at uh, Cincinnati Magazine, which was a, a city magazine in Cincinnati, Ohio. Didn't know anybody there but it was an opportunity to write long magazine features and to begin to sort of develop some long, long form reporting and writing ability. And um, I thought that would be good because ultimately I, I, I had told myself that I wanted to write books, right? I wanted to write nonfiction books, like a lot of the books that I had grown up uh, reading and adoring and being inspired by. And so, so yeah, so I, so I worked in Cincinnati for two years. That's great. You've written so many different things, long form, and then also books. But it seems like just you really like this idea of the long form. And that's also something that we really focus on at Article Club, something usually more than 30 minutes, 30 to 60 minutes. What attracts you about long form specifically? And then also, how do you decide what you're going to try to write about? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, why long form? I think I think it's I think it's just because the things that I read that really fired my imagination and and made me made me amazed and and inspired. The things that I read when I was in middle school and high school in college that I loved were longer things, magazine stories, nonfiction books. I mean, I can remember probably the book that made me want to be uh, a writer more than any other was this book by a New Yorker writer uh, of the golden age named Lillian Ross. She wrote a book called Picture about the making of uh, uh, the movie, The Red Badge of Courage. And it was kind of a a behind the scenes account of how how a movie was put together and then how a movie was kind of taken apart by a Hollywood studio that didn't really have confidence in it. And, um, and it was it was just so kind of intimate and revealing, and the people in it were so alive, and the writing was so beautiful that I I don't know have you have you have you ever just have you ever seen somebody create something and you you love it so much and you're and you're sort of so enthusiastic about it that you you know want to try to do something like that 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 was my that was my experience reading books like Picture. Uh, but there were other books. So, so yeah, so that, that just became my ambition. And, and I, I, I can be fairly single-minded just as a person. And so I, I, have, I have pursued that single-mindedly uh, for, for a lot of my adult life. And in terms of your question, your question about how to, how, to, how to decide what to write about is a really good one. And in a lot of ways, the essential one for, for a writer. You know, what is it that you find interesting? 
Kurt Vonnegut always said that, that you know, this was, this is really the most important question for a writer. And this is the thing that you can answer that nobody else can answer. It's the thing that makes, makes you worth reading. You know, what is it that you find interesting? You have to know that. But, uh, you know, a lot of the time it's, it's sort of, it's not such a rational process at the beginning. It's, 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 it's more intuitive. It's you're responding to, to a, a piece of information that seems intriguing. You have a sense that it might open into a, a kind of a bigger world that might be worth exploring. And then you start talking to people. And it's usually when you start talking to people, when you have that initial conversation with somebody on a story idea, that's when you really know if, if, if you're going to be investing in it or, or, or if it doesn't, it's, if it's not really as good as you, as you thought it would be. You know, sometimes that very first conversation with the source you know, can, can hurl you into months or years of you know, intense work because, because that person is, is just so damned uh, compelling. And that was 100% the case at the beginning of the reporting process of Jerry and Marge go large, I, I had a conversation on the phone with the central figure in the story, Gerald Selby. And after talking to him for about 45 minutes on the phone, you know, I just, I just, I, I turned my phone off and I said, I, I have, I have to do this. I have to try to tell this story. Got, got, got to do it because, because Jerry is, uh, Jerry, Jerry has a tale here that is unlike anything I've ever heard. And, and uh, it's just gotta be, gotta be told. Yeah, we were going to ask, like, how did it get started? And you cold called him. Can you say a little bit more about that first call? Like, how did you decide to call him? And what did you get out of that first conversation? Do you remember? Just because he is just obviously so vibrant in your piece. Yeah, cold calling, an ancient uh, prehistoric practice of, you know, picking, picking up the phone and, and calling somebody that you don't know and asking to talk to them. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it actually worked a lot of the times. A lot of times it doesn't work. But, uh, you know, Jerry is one of the was one of the greatest cold calls I've, I've ever made. I had read a Boston Globe newspaper series that was an investigative series about a series of large um, betting groups who had systematically exploited a mathematical flaw in a Massachusetts state lottery game called Windfall. And the Globe had gotten onto the story. They had figured out that these large betting groups were placing bets of hundreds of thousands of dollars or even more than a million dollars on this game in, in a certain way with a certain strategy where they were, they were basically guaranteed to win if they made large enough bets because the game had this, had this glaring kind of statistical flaw. And so a couple of a couple of these groups had had figured that out, and they were they were making easy money on the lottery. And the Globe series was the tone of it was you know this is a bad thing because these large betting groups are crowding out smaller betters. So it kind of had it had the it had the tone, it had the feel of you know an investigative expose. And in these stories, there there were mentions of this uh, um, uh, older couple in in Michigan. Gerald and Marge Selby, who had also figured out this mathematical flaw. The other, the other large betting groups were, were the kinds of groups that you might expect. They were you know, people affiliated with Massachusetts research universities in the Cambridge area. I think there was, there was a group affiliated with a, a biology lab. A bunch of biologists had figured this out. There was a group at MIT with some students and professors at MIT that had figured out this mathematical flaw in the lottery game and were exploiting it. But then there was this very unexpected betting group that was just this elderly couple in Michigan, Jer Jerry and March. And, um, and so I, it just st it stood out to me. I, I, was, I was curious about them. I wanted to know, I wanted to know more. And so I, yeah, I looked up Jerry's numbers in the phone book. I called him. And yeah, after 45 minutes of talking to him, I, I, knew, that, uh, I knew that I had to do whatever, whatever it took to try to you know, report the rest of the story because he was, not only did he have no shame about what he had done, <laughs> he, was, he was proud of it. And he was proud of it because it was, it was one of the most, fun things that he had, he had ever done in his life. It was, like the sense of fun and, and, uh, and joy and kind of exploration and adventure that, that radiated from, from uh, Gerald Selby on the phone as he told me about his, his caper with the lottery. You know, this retired guy uh, who, uh, who along, with his, along with his wife ended up making more than $20 million completely legally playing the lottery um, by exploiting a flaw that they had discovered on a napkin I mean, it, it, it's, an, it's an amazing story. And, and the, the tone of the conversation was, this was kind of a cool thing in our lives. This is the most fun that we've ever had together as a married couple. And I was, that was something that wasn't reflected in, the, in what I had, had read about the, the cash windfall story so far. And I thought, you know, that, that, I, I want to know, know more about that. 
Yeah, can you say more about their relationship? Because Jerry just comes off the page as joyous and Marge is absolutely hilarious about how she needs something to do and how she's got like a chainsaw, I guess, or like is cutting down trees in the back or something. And, you know, she likes pancakes, you know, at the end. But like, yeah. did, you get a, did you get a sense of just how they were together when you ended up flying out and meeting them? Yeah, so so I I did I did go to Everett, Michigan, which is a, a town in northern Michigan, about two thousand people, small town, um, and it's where Jerry and Marge had had run a convenience store for decades together. You know, they they worked together. They ran they ran the store, and um, and then they sold the store, and and they were you know without anything to do, and that's when Jerry started playing around with these you know equations on, on a uh, napkin and figured out how to break the lottery just because he didn't really have anything else to do. I, it's true that, you know, they had a very close relationship. They, they, they got married young and they had a large family, a number of kids. And, you know, over the years, I, I think there, there's something about their personalities that, that just kind of matched. I mean, Jerry, there's a restless quality to both of them, I think, that comes out in different ways. Jerry's restlessness was always around trying to, trying to get degrees. So, so he, he had a knack for math, but he had never really been able to exploit it. But he loved learning about it. So, so over the decades, as he, as he was sort of working, you know, not, not terribly well-paid jobs in Michigan, he worked at a Kellogg cereal factory. You know, he had a he had a range of other jobs. He was a chemist at a sewage treatment plant. He was a pharmaceutical salesman. He designed cereal packaging. He was a shift manager at the Kellogg's plant. While he was doing all of that, he would he would uh, take classes at night and get math and business degrees. And, and he got a number of degrees over the years. And he was always kind of trying to find something more, some way to apply his knack for math you know, in work and, and just like looking for some, for some way to, to exploit his talent there. And, and for Marge, you know, she was always happy, completely happy stocking shelves at the convenience store. She was, the, she was just the kind of person who had to have something to do all of the time. And when they sold the store, she was, you know, going, going out of her mind a little bit. Yeah, I mean, she was, she was, uh, she'd been going for decades working and as, as soon as, you know, work ended, she was out in the yard, uh, doing yard work, and there was just something about something about the lottery caper for them that allowed allowed the both of them, I think, to to get back into the the kind of work mode and problem solving mode and and uh, uh, manual labor mode that they had always operated really well in. Because the, the surprising thing about the lottery uh, system that they came up with was that it, it required an enormous amount of manual labor, and we can talk about that. But you know, when I when I when I went and visited them and, and saw them interact in person, it was very clear that like Jerry was the trusting one. Jerry was the outgoing one. Jerry was the person who was happy to talk. Jerry was the proud one. And Marge was the reticent one, right? At least initially she had very little interest in talking with me. Um, you know, Jerry, one morning when I, when I got there, Jerry proposed that we all go to a, a diner in town and, and uh, get some eggs and, and talk about the lottery. And he he invited March and said, "March, would you like to go with with uh, with me and Jason down to the diner?" And she said, "No, I don't think I would." <laughs> and uh, and and she didn't. Uh, she didn't. And so it wasn't until I had been there a couple of days that that I think she she kind of relaxed and started to talk a little bit about about her side of the lottery adventure, what it what it had been like for her, and and what she what she loved about it. And and it turned out that just like for Jerry. The thing that she, the thing that she loved about it was that it was fun, it was something for them to do. It was, it was an adventure that they had together that they never could have expected, and uh, and it was a wonderful one. I love this description of joy and fun because it is true. Like we like them because they've exploited this flaw in a legal way, but we also liked them because of how hard they worked even when they were retired. I mean, yeah. you did you did such a great job of it, sort of explaining like how they had to look at all the tickets and they had to get all the tickets. And then that was just in Michigan. Then they go over to Massachusetts, which is not close. This was a lot of work. It was a major physical undertaking. That was the really surprising thing because, because the system involved buying lottery tickets in large volume in person. There's no, there's no real way to do it remotely. You actually, first of all, you have to go to the store. You have to find a store that, to buy, you know, 
tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of tickets at a time. And you, you know, you can't do that in 10 minutes. It, it, you have to, you have to be at the machine and take all these tickets as they're generated. And then once you have, you know, these tens, hundreds of thousands of individual tickets, pieces of paper, then, um, and each ticket will have multiple lottery numbers on it, right? Then you have to go and, and look at all of the numbers and see if, if, which of, which of the numbers are winning numbers. So, you know, Jerry and Marge would put their lottery tickets they bought in these giant duffel bags. And so you just have to picture these, these two people in their, you know, late 60s, carrying around well, giant stuff duffel bags, just packed with lottery tickets, carrying them from the convenience store where they're buying these tickets to a, a, a Red Roof Inn. And in the room of the Red Roof Inn, after the drawing, going through by hand tens of thousands of slips of paper and and seeing which of the numbers are are winning numbers and which of those tickets are are winning tickets for you know if you get four numbers or three numbers or five numbers or whatever how many of those are winning and then and then going and redeeming those and and it wasn't just that they were you know buying tickets at their local convenience store in michigan after a while they they exploited the the, the certain type of game called windfall in michigan um so completely that Michigan actually shut down the game. So they couldn't play it in Michigan anymore. So they had to find a version of Windfall in another state that had the qualities that they needed uh, for their system. And, and they, they found that the Massachusetts State Lottery was, uh, had a Windfall game like that. And so they started to you know, drive seven or eight times a year uh, you know, when there were these uh, certain kinds of drawings. You know, they would get in their vehicle in upstate Michigan. They would, they would cut across Canada. You know, they would listen to books on tape together and they would, dr they would drive to Massachusetts. You know, they'd get their motel room and they would set up shop at these convenience stores that they had cut deals with. And they would, uh, they would just stand there for, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours printing lottery tickets. And, you know, I mean, for, pe for people that age, to stand, just to be on your feet for that long is tough. But especially Jerry and especially Marge just had a capacity for suffering <laughs> that 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 made the system it made the system workable for them but if but if you if you describe the thing i love about the story is that if you describe the system to almost anybody else and said okay you can make you know tens of millions of dollars doing this but here's what you have to do you have to do this 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 i think that some people would say like yeah, that might not be, that might not be worth it. <laughs> I might not be, or I might, I might not just be able to do that. Or I would have to hire, I would have to hire a team of people to help me do that. And of course, most people would never, you know, would never even believe that the system was, you know, was workable in the first place, right? But, but Jerry, Jerry and March believed because they, they believed in Jerry's uh, math ability and they turned out to be uh, spectacularly correct. Yeah, and they kept on winning. They only lost a couple of times and it continued getting bigger and bigger toward the end of your piece where they're in Massachusetts. And that's when you also introduce all the other folks who, for me, came across a little bit more villainous. It's like, look at these people from MIT, look at these like more professional outfits, whereas Jerry and Marge are more like, the pure ones, but that's also the part where you sort of spend some more time on the ethics of this whole thing. Toward the end, I couldn't quite get whether you were trying to open up a conversation about whether Jerry and Marge should maybe have thought a little bit more about this caper. Did you have a sense of that? Yeah, I, I, I had a strong sense that Jerry and Marge and the other members of their lottery group, because it wasn't just them, they formed a company to play the lottery. Um, GS Investment Strategies LLC, and they invited other people in their family and in their town to buy shares. And this was, this was a very unusual kind of American company. This is a company that had no product. It had no physical office. Its only job was to play the lottery. And, and everybody that I talked to who was associated with this company insisted that they had done nothing wrong, right? Like that, that the only thing that they had done was to play the, the lottery as it was designed to be played. And their, their, their main point was that the, the, the Massachusetts lottery knew all along what they were doing and approved of. And um, it turns out that later there was an inspector general report after the Boston Globe series came out. There was, there was some political pressure on the Massachusetts lottery to figure out what had happened here. And there was an inspector general who went back and interviewed everybody involved and produced this really remarkable um, uh, report. And the conclusion of the report was that you know, the argument that Jerry and Marge were making was essentially correct. That, you know, the lottery had known all along they were, that they were exploiting the game. And the lottery didn't 
have a problem with it because you know, the lottery was taking a 40% cut of every ticket. And so the more tickets people were buying, the bigger the cut for the lottery was. And that meant that the, the more money the state could take from the lottery uh, revenues to distribute to cities and towns for, you know, which is, which is the reason that the lottery is supposed to exist, right? It's supposed to be kind of a replacement for certain kinds of taxes and to fund things in your state. Uh, so, the, so the more people who were, who were buying tickets, you know, the better it was for the state lottery. And so if large groups were buying uh, large tickets in a systematic way, that was fine by the lottery. They didn't care because they were, ta they were taking a 40% cut of every ticket. And, you know, Jer Jerry had this, had a, a fairly complicated system of ethics, you know, by which he played the game, which he, which he explained to me in which I explained the story. His, his, his point all along was that, he was going to he was going to exploit his system and play the game and he was okay with that because he believed that that was that was how the game was designed to be played and that the lottery had no problem with it what he was not going to do was was manipulate the game to prevent other people from being able to play it that was where that was where he drew the line and there were some, some other groups playing the lottery that did cross that line uh, in particular, there was, a, there was a group from MIT that figured out how they could manipulate the mechanics of the game to prevent other people from being able to make large bets. And if they could prevent other people from being able to make large bets on certain uh, drawings, then they would be able to take, take down the entire pot of that drawing without having to split it with other large groups. And so without going into the details of how they did this, because I'm not sure that we have time, the MIT group manipulated the mechanics of the game in a way that did shut other people out. And Jerry thought that was wrong. And he actually tried to report them. And he ended up telling Boston Globe a lot, a lot of details about how the MIT group had, had manipulated the game in that way. So, so, so Jerry felt like there was a, a right way to play the game and a wrong way to play the game. And, and I, think, I think that you know, people reading, reading um, the article and now reading the book can, uh, can make their own decision about that. But I, but I think in the end, the, you know, the, the data, the evidence suggests that, you know, that the lottery really was okay with the large betting groups playing the game this way until it became public and there was some, some embarrassment and some political pressure. And at that point, at that point, they cracked down and shut it down, but, but not until then. It's just such a great piece. Could you comment about the details that you decide to put into pieces or to this piece versus everything that you decide not to? It was just really delightful and amazing which specific details about Jerry and Marge and about their, um, their process that you included versus ones that I'm sure that you had to leave out. It's so difficult every time. It's always so difficult. Because when, you, when you're working on, you know, a, lo a long story like this, you have a lot of space and, and, and a lot of room and, and a lot of room to play. But, there, but there's still the amount of reporting that you have to do to, to get your head around a story at, at this scale is enormous. I mean, I, I, I worked on this story off and on for years. It wasn't the only thing that I was working on during that time. But, you know, I, I, I worked on it for, for years for, for the, from the moment that I first had a conversation with Jerry to the, to the time it was published, I think was four years. And that's not because it, it, it really took that long through the reporting process. It's because life happens, right? Like I'm, I, I moved from one part of the country to another, different, just different stuff happened in my life to prevent the story from being able to be published before then. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a long process. And, and so somewhere there's a file of, of overflow from this story of things that didn't make it in. That's tens of thousands of words long. But I don't know. It, 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 as far as selection of details, there there are some that are there's some that, that you that you fall in love with initially when you're writing your first draft, and you realize later that they're actually not that important, and you take them out. And then there there are some details that you learn during your fact check interviews, right at the end of the of the process, that are so good that you can't help put them in. So so one one of those details for this story I remember was just about. Jerry and Marge's days running a convenience store in Everett, Michigan, a small town in Michigan. And I really wanted to portray what that was um, because in many ways it's, 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 it's where they sort of bonded with each other in, in professionally, 
you know, they had this, this, it was their, it was their really their first big professional venture together that kind of set the pattern for how the lottery caper would play out later. So I just want to understand what they were like together in the store and what it was like to run a store in Everett. And, and there was this, this detail that Jerry told me during a fact checking interview and he, and he, and I was just trying to get a sense of like who came into the store. Did he have regulars? And he said, Oh yeah, everybody in town came through the corner store. You know, we had like bankers and we had factory workers, you know, and he said, if, if sometimes I didn't know a customer by name, but I, I knew the customer by his order. So there was a guy I used to call, you know, Paul Mall and, and a Mountain Dew because that was what he would order every time he came in the store. And there was another guy that I referred to as six pack of Strohs. The guy, he was a regular, he would come in and he would order a six pack of Strohs beer. And, and, and he gave me this quote during a fact checker, fact check interview about how, you know, he used to put, he used to have this trick where he would, he would put the beer cooler on to frost late in the evening. And then um, overnight, the beer bottles would develop this layer of frost and it would make them look really irresistible to factory workers who would come in off the night shift. And, you know, they would, they would say this, you know, the corner store has the coldest beer in town. And Jerry just laughed during the fact check interview. And he said, God, did they love that? You know, a lot of 40 ounces went out of that store. I never told them. I never told them the truth. So it was just like a little window into, into Jerry figuring out how to, how to make his store a success. It's sort of like hacking, hacking the system a little bit and a, a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a foretelling of, of what would happen in the lottery story later. And, and that's something that I, that I didn't, I didn't know those details until like right before the story was published. But I, I, I don't know, I, you just, you hear something like that and you have to, you have to put it in. So I think I took something else out to make room for that. I don't remember what I took out, but it was too good not to put in. That's amazing. Thanks for that. And thanks for taking the time, Jason. Thank you so much for being part of Article Club. The last thing that I wanted to ask is you've had books published. You've obviously has a, have a lot of different articles published, but this is your first long form in a book form. Is that true? Yes. So it's, it's part of the permanent record series of Hingston and Olson, which is an independent Canadian publisher. They have taken the story and turned it into a small 76 page book, 72 page book. That is beautiful. I mean, the, the graphic design uh, nerdery that went into the creation of this small book object is, is just off the charts. It's, it's lovely. Um, Hingston and Olson uh, did an amazing job. It's, it's, it's available for sale. So yeah, so, so this, sto this story that began as a, an online only, a magazine story in the Huffington Post Highline is now, a, uh, is now a physical object and now a book. And there's something kind of wonderful to me about, about the, the, permanent, the permanence of a book. It's nice, that, it's nice to have a story online, but when it, when it exists as, as a book, it, but there's something about it that seems more real and, and more lasting. So um, uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful object. It's, it's the kind of thing that I never expected would happen. And, and the whole process of making the book uh, with them has just been a delight. They've, they've done a wonderful job. Yep. Well, I got my copy and it's great. And thank you for all of this. Thank you for chatting with me and yeah. for also making time for Article Club. Thank you, Mark. Uh, and thank you to the Article Clubbers for, for reading the reading story and, and for caring about uh, Jerry and March. I, I really appreciate it. Hope you have a great day. Take care. I want to thank Jason Fagoni yet again for being on Article Club. It's pretty amazing that month after month, these incredible authors generously give us their time and thoughtfulness so that our article club is richer. I can't wait to discuss Jerry and Marge Go Large next Sunday with you. And if you haven't signed up yet for a discussion, you can do that over at highlighter.cc slash discussion. If you have any questions or want to reach out, email me at mark at highlighter.cc. And if you want to sign up for Article Club, that's at articleclub.org. Have a great week.